Begin is the stage. Begin is the stage. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Backstage at Cry Havoc episode. I am your host, Lori Ann Davis, she, her. And today we're talking about sex and orgies. We're going R-rated. And joining me <laughs> to talk about this topic are Amani Zado and David K. Barnes. You've introduced yourselves before, but just in case this is someone's first episode, please can you introduce yourselves with your pronouns and let us know how you're involved with Cry Havoc. Let's go alphabetically. So, Amani. Hey, I'm Amani Zardo. I am the director on Cry Havoc Ask Questions Later, and my pronouns are she, her. Lovely, and David? Hello, I'm David K. Barnes. I'm creator of Cry Havoc, uh, he, him. I believe today we're discussing two very distinct subjects, which are Roman history and sex. And I only know about one of those. So uh, over to you. <laughs> Did you bring your half A4 piece of paper with all the info you found out about the other topic? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, there's tons of diagrams and I'm horrified. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. So, oh. Uh, why did we decide to do an episode on this might be the first question I should ask, which isn't part of the questions I sent you. So sorry to spring that on you. I guess it's because it's, <laughs> I don't know, you say sex and orgies and people giggle and we have a whole episode on it. Uh, ratings. Just about the ratings. <laughs> correct. Correct. That, that is why we've done this. I think it's um, very much, it, it's just one of those things people expect. Everyone has this idea of what uh, ancient Rome was like, which is, you know, licentious sex and, and, and everything going on all over the place. Uh, people would be disappointed if there wasn't an orgy episode. You know, and when you watch, oh, the, you know, things like HBO's Rome is filled with lots of uh, random canoodling going on between various people um, in various places at various times. And so people kind of expect it. It's um, a, a tricky proposition to, to do in what is a bit more of a, a comedy context and to do it on audio. Mm. So I'm sure there are lots of questions to be asked about what it's like to, to direct sort of sex scenes that are meant to be happening through a wall on audio, <laughs> uh, which I wasn't there for any of the recordings of this episode. So I am all ears <laughs> on this one. Did you have a strong response when you realised, oh, I have to direct an orgy. Was it like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, not again, said Amani. <laughs> oh, my goodness. My, my extensive experience with directing <laughs> orgy scenes. No, zero experience. <laughs> and actually, I was very excited. Yay. <laughs> I don't know what this says about me. But I really like the idea of uh, an orgy episode in the series. I like the idea of kind of going somewhere a little bit dangerous. I mean, as we're going to go on. To explain, it's, it's, you know, we ended up doing it in a, what I would describe as, yeah, PG version, but, uh, or style rather. But yeah, I like the idea of pushing. I mean, I've not ever heard a sex scene in an audio drama or a podcast before. So I, I was quite excited to yeah. give that a go. I don't think I have either, actually. David, have you? I haven't. No, not, not no. at all. I mean, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure it has. And I'm sure there are certain um, specialised retailers from which we can get some if we want to find out. <laughs> yeah, I feel like maybe there's a different, maybe not a different audience, but a, a different point to those. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I think that another <laughs> thing that makes it different, I guess, is that I remember when um, there was a TV series, I think it was Spartacus Blood on the Sands, which very much have advertised itself as... Oh, I love that show. Like, <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. Which I <laughs> It was filthy. Advertised itself as like there's lots of sex and so I watched the first episode of it, yeah, there's 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 a lot going on. <laughs> and it, it's very much front and centre in the T V version and I stopped watching and Amani went, oh, I'm in for the long haul on here. <laughs> and um in this series I think it's typically it's because sex is a strong it, it for a, in a lot of not just this, a lot of drama generally, it's a very strong motivating sort of uh sort of propelling thing for characters. And, you know, I think Personally, in, in my own work, I find, you know, sex is a, as, a, as a motivator of dramatic action, I do find it a bit ordinary and kind of a bit dull because it's done so often, it's everywhere. I can only really, really treat sex as a, as a motivation seriously if I'm sending it up and making it silly. Which meant that this was really one of the only episodes where there's going to be a lot of sex sort of maybe going on. Even then, it will often happen. I thought this has got to be this sort of episode where our main characters are there 
for an orgy, but they're not going to ever really be allowed to partake in the orgy. And I like the idea of these characters walking around trying to get people involved. You know, people are trying to get on of their orgy and have a nice time, and somebody's tapping the shoulder, go, "Would you like to talk about politics?" <laughs> I thought that's funny. <laughs> I quite like that. Yeah. And I've, when I was discussing with Robert Valentine, we were trying to find what the tone would be on this, and I said, "I, I don't want it to be." I don't want it to feel sleazy. I, I want the, I want this to be the most good-natured orgy that you've ever heard. <laughs> an orgy that you could take your grandmother to. I want oh this to God. be. Oh God, David. I want this to be like an orgy that is generally very, uh, yeah, sort of a good-natured, quite happy for the star. I don't want it to just feel dodgy. I don't want to feel to feel dirty for listening to this episode, or at least not in not in the wrong way. <laughs> but um, I thought, at least from a scripting perspective, this will be quite sort of light. And then I thought. When this is actually recorded, it'll probably feel much, much, much naughtier. But I think, well, I don't need to think about that. I'm going to just submit the script and walk away. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm going to jump in there because I play a part in this episode, Valeria. And that is actually something that I really, really appreciated. Is Amani, when you emailed me to see if I was interested in taking that part, you were like, it's at an orgy, but don't worry, it's not going to be sleazy. <laughs> and I, that was something that, yeah, I really appreciated you reassuring me on that. So I guess, how would you go about directing an orgy and a, a lot of talk about sex in a, not a sleazy way? Um, I expect the writing helped a lot. Yeah, I was sort of going to come back to that. I feel like uh, one of the things also was that because the character that you play, Valeria, is sort of hitting on Gaius relatively forcefully. Yeah. And that was something that David and, and I talked about and, and I know that that would have come up in discussions with Rob also. So like working out how to create this sort of quite funny situation where this wealthy senator's widow wants to shag Gaius in order to win a bet. Well, specifically bite him on the bottom. Yeah, bite him on the bottom to win a bet. And if she manages this, then she agrees to pay a, a whole lot of money. So yeah, so I think there was some of that also is, is that we talked about quite a lot at script stage was how to... You know, as soon as sex and money come into the same conversation, it, there is a risk that it can become sleazy. And I think that's sort of where the thinking around making sure that it wasn't sleazy, that's where it originated. Yeah, um, I think, we, we, I, I remember actually this particular episode, had, we had very long discussions on plotting particularly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that as soon as you go, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a comedy set, it's an audio, yeah, of course. And yeah, that's very funny. And, that will work. And then when you get down, you know, something that might have passed muster in, a, in, in you know, a, a British sex comedy in the 1970s isn't going to really work now. Um, and I think in, in particular, actually, that plot line that sort of, we kept sort of adjusting and adjusting and changing because if it's just, uh, you know, the, certainly the idea, obviously, our very intelligent protagonist character d gets involved in a sort of double meaning conversation where he doesn't realise that he is where the other person about sex and he's talking about sort of property development, etc. That's very funny and you can go place that. But we don't want to then lure a character into a position where they would be actually genuinely threatened in, in, in any mm. way because then it gets a bit... Uh, um, and so we kept sort of changing and then when we so making the character slightly sort of yeah boozy a senator's wife who's trying to win a bet and it's not like I'm trying to sort of force myself on him but it's something like as silly and almost like a sort of like prank as biting somebody on the bottom in an orgy mm. clearly to them would have felt relatively innocent mm. um, whereas you know of course for guys it would be you go, what the hell are you doing and it would all be sort of ridiculous and sort of slightly madcap that's the sort of the level we thought this is where we can get up to we, we can't really push it beyond that because also this is meant to be Again, this, it should, this should feel a bit naughty, but it shouldn't make anyone feel uncomfortable, including in mm. the recording of. And that's when I think also the tone, I think the scenes at the beginning of uh, characters are very excitedly going off to an orgy, like Lepidus, etc. And, oh gosh, this is going to be a lot of fun. And the whole tone is set for this to be more like a slightly more excessive party, mm. like a rave, mm -hmm. rather than, right, we're going to go to something that's a bit naughty, isn't it? We're going to go to have lots of sex so it's got to be it's got to feel like this very big sort of upright fun this is the big party of the night every cool person's going to and it just so happens there's lots of sex going on but that's the kind of tone that I sort of wanted to go from a from a writing perspective it's meant to be fun it's meant to have a big spirit of fun yeah it's funny because I feel like people were quite nervous about how we were going to go about the actual recording of this episode not the actors hopefully but I feel like more behind the scenes how are we going to manage this and uh, actually I felt quite confident with it I I was like, well, going very much from this place of it's going to be fun. In, in my mind, I was thinking of it more like a 
musical soundtracks like what are the kind of sounds that I want to get from the <laughs> actors that will give a suggestion of you know what's happening without it being explicit and yeah I feel like it was actually quite fun were you at the Walla recording Lowry? I was just thinking I'm so so sad I, I think I was ill I couldn't make oh, yeah. so the just in case you don't know audience member Walla is I don't know what the strict definition is, but it's basically recording the background sounds and noises that we need. So we had... Crowd sounds, yeah. Yeah, we had a Walla session for the orgy. And I was supposed to be there and I wasn't. And I am devastated that I missed it because it would have been so much fun, I imagine. Yeah, it was fun. We haven't actually got to that episode yet. We're recording this backstage episode before we've got to soundscaping Let Slip. So I haven't (laughs) heard it since we recorded the Walla. But uh, I want to describe it more like getting into a cold bath. Just sort of more like, a, ooh, ow, ah. Oh, great. <laughs> Less owls, but more like, a, yeah, it's more playful than, you know, really naughty. <laughs> I like it. That's great. I'm now even sadder that I wasn't there. <laughs> oh, you missed out on, yes, all of the cold baths. <laughs> Good lord. Gosh, darn it. Great stuff. Yeah, I'm really, really glad I don't have to soundscape it. And I'm really interested to see how Katie and then Kathy balance that episode, I suppose. Balance what we're hearing outside of the room or the immediate vicinity that the conversations are happening in then. It's one of those things that you really, it's where, when a writer just sort of <laughs> comes up with an idea and you know tries to put off ever thinking about how it's going to be realized until much later <laughs> okay. mm. someone's gonna to have to make this i think to be honest i would actually be very nervous if if um it was television for instance i think i'd be very nervous about writing a, an orgy based episode for a tv v- series even though it probably again it would be the sort of thing people would expect because i think as as it's sort of i think on, it, it's easier to sort of create that slight uh, that sort of tone of like you know sort of a fun sort of tone rather than a sleazy tone if it's on audio mm. um, especially if the characters are meant to be wandering around sort of groups of grouping people having sex and they're trying to have conversations you can sort of do that on audio in a way which on TV would be I think it would, it would be much harder you'd be veering more into something that would feel a bit exploitative if I were to do a TV version, I think all the scenes would sort of take place in sort of like rooms where nothing was happening. It was all happening behind a different door. We'd kept having characters wandering in and out. And it'd feel more like a 1970s stage farce. <laughs> I'd be much more aware, I think, of the demands being placed upon actors and crew, indeed, if it were visual. And I would probably shy away from it in a way that I know that this being audio, everyone can keep their clothes on yeah. and be in booths and be all very, very safe. So how accurate is it? that orgies were a thing in Rome. You know, that is an image we have of Rome, right? Yeah, I I think it's something which some sort of uh, academics have said it's something that doesn't happen so much or certainly not publicly it's not something that's meant to happen in republican Rome but as the empire comes in you start to get more of it then. I think that's still part of this sort of ongoing narrative even in the ancient sources of it was fine when we had this republican democracy but now it's all gone wrong because we have an emperor and morals have slid it's the idea of things were better back in my day and morality's all gone to pot now so this idea that orgies then happen a lot more later on has sort of grabbed hold i think certainly the idea of sex and religion sort of being put together doesn't happen that was something that's very much viewed as something that other cultures do you know our religion and sex are separate things we don't do at the same time However, I do have uh, uh, some quotes here from the uh, the research that uh, Dr. Southern did. And ah. I asked how common were orgies at this point? Are they open? Are they secret? Etc. We have here, this is a direct quote. There are stories from mixed dinner parties of snogging and groping and boobs falling out. So uh, I'd say that's pretty conclusive. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of sexy love poetry among the upper classes, and so there was still plenty of high-class banging going on. Again, this is an academic historian. This is how we all speak. Uh, among the hot young things, like all the sort of the poets and all the rich people. So again, it's the sort of thing which rich people almost certainly were doing it, and then telling everybody else you shouldn't because it's awful and you ought not to be. So it's similar today with like you know, government ministers doing cocaine you know they, they mm. almost certainly are at least I hope they are because I, I would like an explanation as to why they do the <laughs> things they do but they're never going to say publicly that's what they're up to yeah and I think this is it, it's a difficult thing because a lot of the sources that we have are what is meant to be the case but is not necessarily what actually was going on so it's something which I think a, a great deal of our idea of of orgies in, in, in ancient Rome 
which doesn't really happen in, say, Shakespeare's plays, for instance, even though he did, like, you know, bawdy comedies. I think it does come from this idea of Christianity being the civilizing religion that rises up from the eventual ashes of the Roman Empire. And so the background is this awful, licentious, sexual, violent Rome against which the purity of this religion can sort of flourish and, and stand against. And I think that's partly where it sort of comes from in some depictions uh, later on sort of Victorian era and certainly going into early Hollywood, where there's a film I remember called The Sign of the Cross in the 1930s, of Charles Lawton as Nero, which was a film by Cecil B. DeMille, who did all these big epic capers and the Ten Commandments later on. And they said, you know, he was quite sort of candid in saying, look, if you want to have sex and, and violence on screen, set it in an ancient setting and make sure that the end Christianity wins. Because it means that you can have your cake and eat it. You can depict all these sort of things you wouldn't normally be able to get away with, so long as at the end you say, oh, and that's all wrong, though, you shouldn't do it. And I think that's where a great deal of, you know, whenever you want to have a morality tale in ancient Rome, you just pit a very sort of high-minded politician against lots of people shagging each other, and then you can have both. And I really think if it wasn't for the strong sort of Christian connection, which comes shortly after this point in history, I don't think we'd associate orgies with these ancient civilizations. It, it's, I think that's where it comes from. Or I might be wrong, it might just be we like to see lots of big buff people in togas sort of like shagging each other. 100%, 100%. I mean, Amani's <laughs> a big fan of Spartacus blood in the sand. What do you reckon? Yes, I am. <laughs> I was going to say that some of the stuff that came up in the research before, sort of when I signed up to the project, but before we really kind of got deep into it, David recommended several really good historical books because I knew nothing about this period. And there were a few things that came up about sort of sex and kind of fell also into like the treatment of women and, and marriage in general. And I think one of the things that it seems to me that I understood from these books, that there was a certain amount of freedom around sex, uh, whether this is related directly to orgies or not, or whether it's just a certain amount of openness and freedom around sex and extramarital relations was this idea that your heir didn't have to necessarily be your biological son. And we see this in the case of Gaius, who is, becomes the heir of Julius Caesar, even though he was not his biological son, he was his niece's or sister's son or something, I believe. And so there seem to have been lots of instances where marriages would happen very much for political reasons and in order yeah. to start political relationships between families and clans as it were the husband and wife didn't necessarily live in the same house didn't necessarily sleep in the same bed and it was sort of understood that they might be having sexual relations with other people and that was sort of accepted and divorce happened people would divorce and and remarry in order to start up new political allegiances so there was this kind of freedom around yeah i, I think it is that kind of do what you like as so long as I don't find out about it, almost. I doubt they'll, the husband and wife will like come from their separate sort of liaisons and sit down at the breakfast table and talk about it, but they, yeah. you know, it most likely is, is happening because all the marriages are usually happening for a political reason. I think there are stories of you know, Julius Caesar and then numerous Roman leaders when they go abroad and meet sort of dignitaries there. That's, you know, one way of making sure you have an alliance is you then, you, after the politics has finished, you then have sex with them. There's a lot of this sort of going on. But again, it's a tricky thing because as so often, all the ancient sources will mainly discuss what's going on with the, the rich and the elites and the powerful. Very rarely will they talk about what's going on with the ordinary people. And then some of it might also be sort of speculation. Uh, another way of trying to demean a political opponent is to say that they sleep around or they, they're down at a, at, a, at a brothel and they're doing this, that and the other thing. And a lot of these stories go around and sometimes they're reported as fact in sources. Sometimes it is just said, it is said that such. A lot, you can get away with a lot of things in ancient sources if you just preface it by saying it is said that and then you can put as many lies and personal attacks as you want but it is hard to know I think there's a certain amount of guesswork going on I would imagine in some ways it's more there's more social awareness of it going on than perhaps in say like today British society in some ways because there is a lot of art there's a lot of like sex, sexual art going on in quite public places and public baths in ancient Rome in a way that maybe doesn't quite happen the Victorians haven't happened to them for example <laughs> yes that really interested me what you said Amani that the heirs don't have to be biological heirs at this time and I imagine I think I'm definitely bringing a lot of my own opinions and frame on this 
But I imagine that would be freeing for women in a way, because I don't know, I think my belief, whether this is fact or not, is that a lot of the patriarchy is tied up in controlling women and controlling the air, making sure that it is your air. But if it doesn't matter if they're your child biologically, then it doesn't matter if the women are sleeping around. Well, and also you would have women who had children from previous marriages who would then mm. go through a divorce and marry again. Because it doesn't have to be a bloodline necessarily air, I'm sure I read this, that actually children from other marriages potentially, if, for example, their father had died and the mother was remarried now, if there was a good relationship, that child would join in the sort of gaggle of young children that would follow this patriarch about his business in order to learn. You know, this was how they had their schooling. And so... I don't know, it felt kind of like more of a meritocracy. And so you could have your niece, not your nieces, you could have your nephews and your, your cousin's yeah. children. I mean, having said that about maybe it being easier for women, I am aware, particularly from the episode we just recorded with Sarah, David, that obviously Rome is very patriarchal. So it's not going to be great, but... <laughs> it's a tricky one in terms of how much of for what the better words, sexual mobility women had at this time. Are they able to choose their partners? Are they able to do this and that? Again, it falls down to you are more respected if you are very prim and proper and you are not sort of carrying on behind your husband's back. And so we know which women were regarded as probably being like that and which women were probably sleeping around a lot because they are then insulted a lot in the male written histories and records. But we still don't really know because Roman history is rife with hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. um, and so then it comes straight down to, to, to the orgies. It may be that everyone was having orgies every damn day. I um, mean, we know that Gaius goes on to be a propaganda machine, right? He could yes, have absolutely. erased all of them. Now, That's uh, yeah, he, when he becomes uh, Emperor Augustus, he sets himself up as the ultimate family man. He says that these are the rules, these are the ethics that everyone should abide by, um, that you should be you know, totally devoted to your family, that nobody should ever sleep around anywhere. And if, you're, you know, if, if a child of yours is uh, guilty of cheating on their partner, you should shun them for the family. Wow. I know one of the questions you had was about Cleopatra, mm, yeah. the usual sexualization of Cleopatra mm -hmm. in other works, which was something that me and Amani talked about a lot I remember for this in particular I remember the I can't remember which episode it is but there's an episode where she and uh, Fulvia have many sort of conversations for a while and then they end the evening by doing the equivalent of booking a hotel room and going right well the work's done let's have a quick roll on the hay that'll be fun yeah alright and we, we just sort of discuss that I, I wanted something there to again show sort of the, the bisexuality and the sort of the sexual fluidity of some of our mm. characters which I think is very important anyway but I know, Amani, when I mentioned it to you, you said you, you wanted, to, quite rightly, there to be no insinuation that Cleopatra was using sex to get what she mm. wanted or sex as a tool of manipulation. That it was very much a, well, our working day is done. How should we enjoy ourselves? and How should we have a bit of fun at the end of the day? Oh, do you fancy a, a quick one over the hotel? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, all right. I've got a bit of time. Okay, <laughs> off we go. And we discussed that in some detail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we really did. And... You know, historically, Cleopatra and Mark Antony do end up uh, becoming something of an item, but even then, I want to sort of subvert to the way you might get there. And I think it's even there in, in the very ancient text. Cleopatra was seen as this person who had uh, was a, a great sexual danger to incorruptible Roman men, and she could corrupt the incorruptible because she is a foreign queen, and she clearly uses sexual wiles to blah 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 blah, and all this propaganda, very misogynist and aggressive towards uh, the Egyptian culture. Equally, a lot of other sources say that Cleopatra is incredibly intelligent and she was very charismatic. And this sort of idea that, oh, she just sexually seduced everyone and was trying to use it to get what she wanted. I've always said, oh, she was just good at talking yeah. to people. People just wanted to be around her because she was so intelligent and she was bright and she would really just, she was just the sort of person who walked into a room, lit up a room, and thought, oh my God, the person everyone wants to talk to was just so mm. great. And that's something I wanted to sort of get at. I, I find, and again, this is characters who use sex to get what they want in drama can of course be jolly interesting but I personally don't find that a very exciting thing to go down I, I suppose it's because I don't know many people uh, who as far as I'm aware use sex as a manipulative tool to get what they want I most yeah. people I know use sex as a way of of having a, a great time with their partner or their friends <laughs> yeah and so it would be reflected rather better in the characters of the show if it's a similar that they've all got their jobs to worry about and saving the country and doing this and putting on theater plays but sex is just if something for them which is 
but it's fun. Yeah. It's a really fun thing to Completely. do. I think you do that really well. Like everyone, well, not everyone, that's incorrect to say, but like there are a lot of characters who are sexual, but are not yeah. sexualized. And I really appreciate that, obviously, with the women, because that yes. is a trope. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess you've just put Mark's worry. Is it episode three where he's like obsessed with the yes. fact? Episode four. Yeah. Yeah. He's obsessed with this idea that he knows what happened with his mate, Julie, Julie Caesar. Yeah. And so he's got these stories. Oh my God, she's going to, she's going to seduce me. And you know, all Cleopatra needs to do is hello. She goes, Oh my God, did you see that? God, the gall of that woman. And then she just couldn't <laughs> care less. There's a picture of Cleopatra in his early scenes with something. I remember me and Amani having very long conversations on of, we want to make sure that Cleopatra is as she would be very intelligent and that Mark's sort of fear and paranoia it needs to look utterly ridiculous yeah. and so there can't even be any undercurrent there's nothing that she can say that could even be taken it's not like she sort of knows and she cocks an eyebrow and does a sort of saucy joke every so often no she's just quite straight down the line hello I'm here to talk about politics please and she goes oh my god she's talking about sex yeah. <laughs> and that's the sort of level we've got to play it at <laughs> And then Cleopatra can be really frustrated. She goes, I just want to get some work done. And this, this fool just keeps going on about all this nonsense. And that's quite a fun thing to play with. But the, the opposite side is we don't want it to be the stereotypical sort of, you know, ice queen woman who'd be fawed out by the right man or whatever to go, no, she enjoys sex. It's not that she's against sex. It's just that sex and work don't actually mix, yeah. which is a big middle finger to many of the depictions of Cleopatra that say that's what yeah, she's all about. Absolutely. Did you have chats with Lara, who played Cleopatra, about this? Well, when I asked Lara to audition for this, because uh, we've worked together in the past, I did tell her that we wanted to portray Cleopatra sort of against type, as it were, and to highlight her intelligence and to give her room to also have moments of comedy, which I feel like are quite rare for female characters. It's not, it's not often that you get comedy female characters. It's definitely not common to have sexy, smart and funny. I mean, obviously this is becoming more and more of a thing now, thankfully. Yeah, that was very much at the forefront of our minds. It's a more nuanced portrayal mm. right it's not because it, you can also go too far the other way where it's like oh my gosh this woman is amazing at everything no exactly and it's like well no she's a real person and and i think that's true of i'd say that's true of all the characters well definitely all the female characters because that's what i've given most thought to i suppose in the series as well because like octavia too very sexual mm. character not sexualized yeah. same with charmian fulvia totally yeah i think that's a really sort of neat way of putting it sexual but not sexualized it's something which i certainly in writing have done in i did in wood and overcoats and other shows where there's always a sense that people were having wonderful sex lives like you know over there <laughs> but never to mm. the main characters because it's a british comedy so you know they can't ever <laughs> one of my shows and I wanted could I do that in ancient Rome and it turns out you can <laughs> so it's <we're> great <laughs> um, and uh, also you know huge thanks to uh, Armani for allowing me to have this strange <laughs> sort of sexually liberal yet also sanitised version of Rome <laughs> um, not at all not at all uh, there was no allowing happening it was just uh, wonderful and joyous and I uh, loved all of it I, I, I thought I might get a call saying David we need more sex in it put more sex we need to, we need to sell this show more, more sex David and you go alright alright have, have an episode <laughs> set in an orgy there we go an orgy episode that's what it comes from Later tonight, Armani calls him and says, Oh, I don't have orgies. <laughs> Puffs out a cigar. Oh, Gosh, your, your Armani impression is is wonderful. <laughs> it's like there are two Armanis it's on spot the call. On. I want an orgy on my desk by tomorrow morning, <laughs> slams the phone. Transformative. Actually, we've run quite a way over on this one. So it might not appear so to the audience because I wonder how much of it will make it through. I wonder how much of this I will have cut. And then Armani <laughs> goes, No, cut even more of it. We'll see. But we hope you enjoyed. Thank you for coming along with us. Amani and David, thank you so much for joining and having this conversation. Thank you. Uh, would you like to say goodbye? Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. Backstage at Cry Havoc is a podcast distributed by Rusty Quill and licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, share-alike 4.0 international license. It is directed by Armani Zardo, produced by Laurie Ann Davis, with executive producers Alexander J. Newell and April Sumner. This episode was edited by Laurie Ann Davis and Catherine Vernella. Thanks for listening. <laughs>